is Michael Davis. I'm the pastor here at First Baptist Church, Elba, New York. I wanted to welcome you here this morning. If you're a member, we're glad you're here. If you're a visitor, we're also glad you're here. And I'd like to invite you to reach out to the email listed below, office at fbcelba.net. And so uh, this week, we've gotten some new updates. And for our state, uh, it looks like we'll be reopening in phases. And while churches may not fit into the first phase, uh, there will be a phase that we do fit into. And so I want to reassure you and encourage you that as we walk through this difficult season, there is an end in sight. And there's a time when we will be brought back together again. Now, this week also brings more difficulty for us as a church family. And so uh, what I'd like to ask for you to do this week is, in particular, um, pray for the Gray family. We know that Esther uh, came home from the hospital and is on, on hospice care as of this last Monday. And uh, I want to encourage you to reach out, um, send a note, a kind word, uh, and pray uh, for both David and Esther and their family. While we continue to be at home and watch the service online, uh, I would like to just encourage you with the words from the quiet time today. And this is what it says in Psalm 37, verse 1. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Church family, it seems as though, especially in times like this and as there's other difficulty going on in our family of faith, that to be patient and wait on the Lord is a very difficult thing. Uh, what I've seen though, is tremendous growth from our church family. Uh, I want you to know um, that I am praying for you and your family if you're connected with our church and a member of it. And so with that, let's remain patient and focused and calm as we look towards uh, a time when we'll be able to come back together. And we bear the burdens of each other as we pray and look forward to that time. And let me just make this note that, that during this time, of difficulty. We've got a great team that's working behind the scenes and is preparing things for us to come back to services, uh, whether it be our deacons who are carefully praying through uh, the, the places and the times that we need to be in and the precautions we need to take as we look towards coming back together in the future. Or uh, maybe it's our trustee team who's been taking care of the facilities and, and upkeeping things even while no one's been in the building. That maybe uh, our worship team, our tech team, those who've been working together to uh, put together the videos and uh, produce uh, a worship setting for us to continue to be able to do that even though we're doing it online. So I'd like to thank everybody who's you know, part of the team and, and everybody who is, who is waiting with eager expectation to come back and be able to be together. I want you to know that I'm looking forward to the time when we'll be back together again, worshiping together in our church. I hope you enjoy the service today. Tell 
it now to thee. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. Tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it. Hi, church family. Uh, I am coming to you from my basement, and this is about as raw and real as it gets down here. Um, we have an electric piano down here that is small. It doesn't play very loudly, no matter how loud I turn it up. But um, I'm hoping it's a better, a better accompanist than my old out of tune piano upstairs. Um, this song. I want to share I heard for the first time a few weeks ago. I heard it in the car. It was just before we were leaving to go to um, Boston. I was driving back from Lockport one night and uh, I heard this song and I just wept. This song is beautiful and um, it has a haunting uh, sound to it because of the minor chords. But the words and the promises of God in here are, are beautiful and they were such an encouragement to me and I hope that is an encouragement to you also. I also hope that I can I can play it. For anyone who's prayed a thousand prayers and still can't find the answer anywhere, fighting off the lie that no one cares. For anyone who's out there. Forsaken and alone, clinging to the last strands of your own. May God give you eyes to see. Thank you. 
Choosing to believe he's in control May God give you eyes to see He's still greater Courage to rise and believe He's able May God be your peace in the fire You're walking through This is my prayer is my prayer for you. May your eyes be ever on the Lord, your helper. May you find your refuge in your Lord, your shelter. Today, we're going to be looking at this idea of living and giving. And we're going to be looking at this phrase, living committed to God means giving sacrificially. And we're coming right out of Nehemiah chapter 10. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10. And we've been in this series, 2020 for the next 200. Now, interestingly enough, we're coming to the end of that. So whether or not we finish this online together, whether or not we finish this in person, I know that God has got a special, special word for us. In the series, 2020 for the next 200, we've been using this phrase, putting on gospel lenses to see God's vision for our church. And really what we're looking for is a vision for the future. What is God going to do? Now I know times seem difficult right now. Times seem hard. Sometimes it's hard to see the hope. It's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But God wants us to see the things that we need to learn during this time. And he's teaching us so many things. And he's got one more thing to show us today. And so you'll find yourself in Nehemiah chapter 10. Uh, we'll be looking at living and giving. Living committed to God means giving sacrificially. Tomorrow, we celebrate Memorial Day. Now, whether you uh, have friends or family members, those who have served in uh, any branch of the military with the United States, we want to celebrate um, those today that have gone and given their lives. We celebrate that as Memorial Day. Now, um, today we, we celebrate this remembrance of those who have paid the ultimate price, who have made the ultimate sacrifice. And so I want to thank you if you've got friends or family members who have, have done that. Just thank you for those family members who have committed to keeping us free. And I, and I want to just kind of preface what we're going to go into with this. John 15, 13, and it says this, Greater love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Uh, we live in a great country. While we go through a great struggle, we still celebrate and we still remember those who have gone before us and paid the ultimate price to give us freedom. And so I think this verse reminds us of that, reminds us of that. 
And it's important for us to recognize the giving of life and the giving in many other areas that we do on a regular basis. The giving of ourselves, the giving of money, the giving of time, the giving of whatever it might be. Now we see this in the world around us. We give to our jobs, we give to our families, we give to the church. And again, I think when sometimes when people hear that, they think of just giving monetarily. Now today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a lot of other things too. We've got to think about how God wants us to live, and the way that we live will really reflect on the way that we give. And so I think this is a really, really cool text in Nehemiah 10 that we're going to look at to look at today. I want to just encourage you during this time, uh, my wife, Christy, and I, our family, we've been praying a lot throughout this time. We've been um, studying, we've been reading our Bibles. I think a lot of people in this time have, have prayed more, have read their Bibles more, have, have spent that time with the Lord more so than maybe they've ever done ever. And I think that's a good thing. And God's pointing us in this right direction, he's, and He's molding us and shaping us, and especially right now in a difficult time, He's using this to help us understand where we're going, each individually and as a church. And the background of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which were written together by Ezra, is just this. The people of God, they were separated from the land that God had given them, the promised land. They had been conquered by nation after nation after nation. And now finally, in this, in this stretch of time that's taken place in their return and rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the wall, they've celebrated. And now they're going to take a hard look in the mirror and say, and how do we live rightly? How do we give rightly to God? So a life that is set up to live in the right way and following God's law, his statutes, his precepts, points us into giving in a variety of ways. Not only just giving of our finances, but giving of our time, our resources, our possessions. God says to us, if you can love me completely without anything else in the way, then I'm going to give you the ability to give freely. And so with that, we'll find ourselves in our first point, living like a child of God. And you're going to find this in Nehemiah chapter 10, 28 through 31. Now let me just preface this. There's going to be the, those first 27 verses, um, which I want to just summarize for. So basically it's a list of those who have committed to remember what God has done for them. Turning their focus completely and wholly to God, being separated from the peoples of the land. So they've made that commitment again, and where I want to find us today is starting in verse 28. So go ahead and turn there, and then again, it's living like a child of God. So in verse 28, it says this, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and those who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding. So this is really uh, in the beginning about uh, the entirety of God's people. See, God doesn't just leave um, a certain person out of the plane. He doesn't just say, okay, you know, you're on the bench and I'm not going to have you participating in this. No, he wants us all involved. And he lists off this, this long number, this large group of people who need to be involved in the plan and what's going on. Now, anyone who could understand to be holy in the family of God was separated from the peoples of the land. So if you were of the Hebrew people, you, were part of the family of God. And, and now aren't you glad that Jesus came and he lived a sinless life and he died on the cross so that we could all be grafted in to his family. That's such good news, isn't it? Now we look back to the Old Testament and we see how God's people served him, how they loved him, how they followed him. And he says, you're a part of the family of God and you're a part of what's going on. And I want to remind us of that. He's expanded that. He's grafted anyone who would choose to follow him and his family. And here's verse 29. It says, Join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a, a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. Now here's what's taking place. There's a returning to the value of God's word. They've been separated from it for so long. They've been separated from the teaching. They've been separated from the corporate worship. Sound familiar? And they're coming back to this place. They've had this great worship service and they're reminding themselves of who God is. Remember last week, God's his nature, his character, his identity. And then we find ourselves in chapter 10 and we're looking at this idea of living like a child of God. And in verse 29, they're looking at obeying God the word. That's so difficult, isn't it? Now we have conversations, my wife and I, with uh, Alana, our daughter, all the time. We're trying to teach her, how do you obey the word? What is the word of God? We've got to remain focused daily in God's word, centered on him, because I can tell you this, it is the only thing that will get us through a time like this. And then in verse 30, 
It says, We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Now remember, intermarriage was a big issue for the people. They continued to marry with those who were outside of the family of God. They were being pulled in all different directions. And if you remember, this is how the kingdom of Israel began to self-destruct. God gave specific direction. Do not take many foreign wives for yourselves. You find this in Deuteronomy. And, and what did Solomon do? He took many wives of foreign descent. And the scripture says that at the end of his life, even though he was the wisest man that, have ever, that had ever lived and ever has lived, he turned away from God. His heart was pulled away from God because of those that he had bonded his heart with, his wives, that worshipped idols. And so we've got to remember that. It's important. How, how do we find ourselves? Who do we, kids, teenagers, as you're thinking about this, who do you marry? That matters to God. And then in verse 31, it says, And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Now, wow, this is, a, this is a big thing that's happening here. They had a little bit different system and practice than even we do today. They're looking at maintaining holiness, and in the seventh year, there's not going to be any harvest. So they had to store up everything that they had to give the land a break, to give the land time to rest. And there was forgiveness of debt. So if you had a debt against anyone, uh, every seventh year, everything would be forgiven. As the pandemic started, I had conversations with many church members about what this reminded of. Many of them had said, I've never seen anything like this before, just as far as very few people being out, stores being closed. And I spoke with one of our members in particular, Henry Oldenhouse, and, and he reminded me of the blue laws, which, which uh, prohibited the sale of, of alcohol on Sundays and man, many other things. In fact, he told me about a time when gas stations were closed on Sundays and you had to make sure you had gas before Sunday, you wouldn't be able to go anywhere if you wanted to. And so, but now nothing is holy to us. There's no sacred space. There's no holy time. There's no day that's been set apart for the Lord, for the rest of our culture. But maybe we need to get back to creating some spaces. Maybe in the midst of all this craziness, of the midst of all this worry, um, you, you haven't been able to maybe peacefully sit and have time with the Lord. And so I, I want to encourage you to do that. If you haven't done it, if you haven't just maybe set aside a large amount of time a day to spend with the Lord, a day for your family to gather, to talk about the things of God. And I'm not saying not to have any other fun, not to go and do other things. No, we don't have Sunday football. We don't have those kind of things going on. Um, let's enter into that dialogue that has to do with God and not anything else, because that has a lot to do with living like a child of God. Here's the phrase we want to remember. Living committed to God means giving sacrificially. So we kind of looked at what living looks like in, in Nehemiah's time, how the people were recommitting themselves to holiness. And maybe this is a time that God is giving us to do that. And so if we can live committed to God, he's going to give us this ability to give sacrificially. And that looks like a lot of different things. We're just going to talk about a few now. And so here's our second point, giving like it belongs to God. Have you ever struggled with that? Maybe giving of your time, you say, well, I, you know, my job keeps me busy and, and I just don't have the time to dedicate to the Lord. I don't have a time to spend reading my Bible to, to prayer. Uh, and so that's just a difficult thing for me. Or maybe for you, you have a hard time giving sacrificially of maybe your gifts, your talents, your abilities. God has given every single one of those to you for the glorification, for the, uh, for the lifting up and encouragement of the body of Christ, of the church. And, and so I know sometimes, though, we just think, well, you know, no one would care about my gift, or maybe I like to keep my abilities to myself. God has given those to us for a reason. Or maybe for you, like, like many others, you struggle in the area of, of personally giving of finances, and we call that a tithe at our church. And, and I think many people, when they hear that, they, they think, oh, great, you know, we're talking about giving again. But the truth is that, especially in a time like this, I think God is giving us perspective. He's saying, maybe in financial heartache, hardship, maybe in loss of a job, maybe in a stressful situation, God wants to give us the ability to choose to be faithful to Him in whatever ways that looks like. And I think financially is one of those things that He's doing right now. Christy and I have been praying. We've been talking. We've been thinking over those things. And, and we've committed to, even during this time, we've said, God, what do you want us to give that, that might even be over and above what we normally give? to the church in order to see that ministry can continue to happen that when we're especially when we're able to meet together there're going to be projects and things that when we come back we have to realize 
and things need to be taken care of. And so I want to just encourage you in that, that maybe God's just given you an opportunity to do that. And so we're going to find ourselves in Nehemiah 10, 32 through 39, and we're looking at this idea of giving like it belongs to God. Everything does. God's given us the opportunity to grow right now. In verse 32, it says, We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel. And for all the work of the house of our God, we the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it to the house of God according to our Father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. Now, if we're committed to God, we're going to be giving in a lot of ways regularly. Now, just in this text, it, it talked about, yeah, their money, their um, possessions, the wood offering, the grain offerings, the thing that uh, gave them life, that sustained them. They would give those things to the work of the Lord. Now, time is one of these, and so I think um, for us, maybe you think, well, you know, I'm not the pastor, so how do I give my time? Well, maybe you teach a Bible study. Maybe um, you work with the worship team. Maybe you work with the AV tech team. Now, maybe you give your time in other ways in, in preparing or planning, and maybe you work with our, our hospitality team, the ones who prepare meals and clean up after things. And um, I want to just encourage you, there's a lot of ways to get involved. No, now it may seem discouraging, when we're able to do that, I promise you there's going to be an opportunity for you to serve. And so think about your time. How do we give of our time to the Lord? Now, God also wants us to be faithful in our giving. He wants us to think of really all the things that we're given financially, all of our money as belonging to him. So when he says to us, I want you to give this to the work of the ministry. I want you to give this to this person. We're able to, like we talked about uh, several weeks ago, we talked about generosity and living in a way that honors God in being uh, freed up of the things of this world. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't use what we're given to take care of our needs, to take care of our families, our obligations, but yet we use what we have. We've been blessed with to bless others and for the work of the ministry. And the people of God during this time, they were doing the same thing. They were relearning some of these things. And so I think for us, you know, maybe sometimes we get worried, we get scared, so we get worked out of those habits of, of giving to what God is doing. And I want to just encourage you that those spiritual disciplines are so important during this time. Now in verse 32, it says, They took on themselves to give a third part of a shekel for the house of God according to the law of Moses. Now every male over the age of 20 years old was required to give this offering. And so it would have only been about 0.14 cents. Um, but if you take that and you spread that over the people of God, about 50,000 people, and you put that together, you're going to get about, you know, today, $3,500. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but there were various offerings that were given and required of the people. Now, how awesome is it that at the time in which we live in, God says, you are free to give regularly um, as you please to the Lord. And although while we still have um, an expectation to give uh, like we would in the Old Testament and to give a, a tithe, to give a tenth of what we already have, uh, first fruit to the Lord. And we'll see that in this text as well. But then we're also encouraged to say, God, how could I give in a way that would be over and above? How can I give my time, my money, my resources, my possessions to the work of the ministry? Now we have to ask ourselves those kind of questions. In verse 33, it says the showbread. It was this bread set on a table. It was 12 loaves in the presence of God on the Sabbath day. And so the, the priest would take the bread. They would set it out. It would, the, Either money was given to purchase these or someone would give the bread and it was set out before the Lord as a food offering. We see the showbread and, and this grain offering in Exodus 29 um, where the, this is instituted and the people start doing this. And then Numbers 28 as well. It's simply an expression of something that, that we need. We need food to live on a regular basis. And so we say, hey God, here is the food that we need on a regular basis. Now, we're not required to do those things anymore. But it's interesting that in every aspect of the people of God's life, they were asked to submit in giving. Now, the burnt offerings are found in Ezra um, 8 at the beginning. We were looking at many, many weeks ago, Ezra chapter 8, there were burnt offerings that were given. And then the Sabbath new moon festival and appointed feast you'll find in Numbers 28, if you'd like a reference for that. 
Now, making atonement offerings, sin and trespass offerings, you'll find in Leviticus 4.20 and Numbers 5. Eight again, Leviticus 4.20 and Numbers 5.8. Okay, now there's a lot of different offerings that are referenced here that aren't necessarily things that we practice right now, um, but yet it points us in this direction of if we're going to live in a godly way, we have to be willing to give sacrificially. And the people of God did this. Now it looks a little different for us now, but we can relate to what's going on in, in their context. Verse 34, lots. So now these were used at various times to determine God's will. And so the wood offering, that would it just sounds exactly like what it is, the wood offering for the burnt offering offering for the altar of God. Now they cast lots and they said, okay, now you're going to take the wood offering here. You're going to take the wood offering here. Now it would have been an, an honor to do this. Now let me remind you um, what's involved in the wood offering. The person who was responsible for it would have to go out uh, into wherever there would be a wooded area, trees, place that maybe they owned or someone else did where they could cut down the wood. They could chop it up. They could split that wood. They could load it up. They could bring it back to the temple. Now if you've ever split wood, if you ever cut down a tree and split wood, cut firewood, you know it takes time. And so I want to just remind us that, that even in this example for the people of God, the wood offering, it took time, it took effort, it took sacrifice to give to the work of the ministry the things that needed to be done. Now, I want to remind you of another way that maybe we sacrifice. I know many of you have served on committees and, and done things like this in the past. Um, this One of my first uh, committees that I ever got to serve on was a committee at Wedgwood Baptist Church. And it was my freshman year in college. And uh, for whatever reason, one of the pastors, uh, and this was the church that I grew up in, that I had served in, I was serving in presently in the college ministry, contacted me and said, uh, Michael, uh, we w there was a vote and, and we would like for you to come and serve on the uh, pastor worship pastor search committee. And so I did and I thought, oh, well, this will be a breeze. Well, I ended up spending about nine months, uh, two to four hour meeting once a week. And um, I can't tell you that the joy that I got out of that, it was a great sacrifice of my time. But at the end of that, um, we found uh, a guy that we believe God led us to and um, and just in the same way that you formed Pastor Church, and you did that recently to bring uh, me and my family here to serve. And we've been uh, so grateful to be here and to do this work with you in the ministry, especially during this time. And so we, at Wedgwood, we, in that committee, we brought um, that, that guy there. And he's actually still there today. His name's Phil Beck, um, a friend of mine and a co-worker and laborer in the ministry. Um, he's one of the longest-serving worship pastors that's ever served at Wedgwood Baptist Church. It's been 12 years um, since he was called there. And uh, so I want to just remind us that sometimes um, God is asking us to serve, to give in different ways. And when we hear giving, I think we think it's only about money. And it's not, not about that. It is, but it's also about time. It's also about resources. It's also about possession. It's also about skills and giftings. Everything that you have has been given to you by God and belongs to him. Let us think like that so that we can live in a godly way so that we might give sacrificially. And that's what we need to be reminded of. Living committed to God means giving sacrificially. Verse 35, it says this, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree year by year to the house of our Lord. Also to bring the house of our God to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and of our contributions, the first of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. Now, in verse 35, these first fruits were given as a direct support for the priests and Levites to do their job. Now, I think there's a reason that God, he points us to these first fruit offerings. Because if we're being honest, I think maybe if at times we've struggled with with giving whatever it is, money, time, resources, possessions, we tend to think of what belongs to God or what God wants us to give for the work of the ministry last, right? We think, oh, well, now I've got this much left over from my paycheck. Maybe I've got this amount of time left over at the end of the week, and I've got maybe half an hour, 10 minutes. I'll give that to God. God does not ask for what's left over from us. He asks our first fruits. And so we're reminded of that, even in the Old Testament, as the require that was made, the obligation, how great is it? And I've heard people say this sometimes before, we're not obligated to give, 
but yet God gives us the grace and the freedom to not only give what the people of God did in the Old Testament, but since we're under grace, since we're under the blessing of salvation through Jesus Christ, we are able to give freely as much as we please. Now, I want us to think about that mindset as we continue to move through this text. In verse 36, it talks about giving the first and the best to God. It says the firstborn male of every family and of the livestock um, were set apart for holy purposes. Now, uh, maybe you think, well, I'm not going to give my firstborn, <laughs> but uh, maybe in other ways you think, well, how can I give my best? How can I give my first fruit? And I'll tell you that I give the, the very first, the very best of my time every single day to God. And I think we need to think about that even in things like our prayer time and our quiet time. When do you do that? Do you do that at the end of the day when you're exhausted? Maybe you're a night person, so you're better then. Uh, maybe you're better at midday. I know I'm the very best when I first wake up in the morning. So I get ready and I spend time with the Lord and, and I devote that time to Him because it's my very best in regards to my time. And so everything else we need to think about, what is our best and how do we give that to God? How do we say whatever is first, whatever is best, it belongs to you, God. And in verse 37, they gathered the first fruit offerings of everyone to the storehouse of the Lord in the temple. And they used it to support the priests and the Levites and the work of the ministry that was going on then. So they, they didn't have to go outside of the temple and devote themselves uh, fully to the work of God. Maybe you know you find yourself in this position. You're not a, a full-time minister, which is a low, low, very low percentage of people in the world. And, and so you think, well, God, how can I work? How can I serve? Well, God, first and foremost, wants you to think, how can I first give what belongs to him? And then how can I serve with the rest of what he has given me? And remember, it's the first and it's the best. Now, the tithe was this, this ancient practice of giving at least 10% of what they had. And you'll find this in Genesis 14, 20, 28, and 22. There was this holy and set-apart gift. You'll find this in Leviticus 27, 30. Numbers 18, 23 through 32. Malachi 3, 8 talks about robbing God of the tithe. And again, this is a is meant for the Levites and the work of the ministry. In Leviticus, you'll find this in 13, 10 through 12. In Numbers 18, 21 through 32. And remember, we need to be about living committed to God and this gives us the ability to give sacrificially and that is all aspects of our life. Verse 38 it says, And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be the Levite. When the Levites receive the tithes and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse for the peoples of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers, we will not neglect the house of our God. So in, in verse 38, there's this pastoral e expectation of giving. There's this, the priest and the Levites, Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of God. Uh, now I've heard it said before, even by other ministers, so there's no need to give what's already been tithed on. And I, and I want to just share this with you because I think it's unfair maybe to make an expectation of you um, when I don't share with you what, what me and my family practice. We give faithfully um, over and above what would be the normal tithe. And then we also think about those special gifts. How can we give monetarily? How can we give of our possessions? How can we give uh, of everything, our time, our skills, our resources, to the work of what God is doing. And there was the same expectation on the Levites. They were given the tithe to do the work of the ministry, but then they themselves also gave a tithe on the tithe. So I want to encourage you, maybe if you've been fortunate during this time, if you've kept your job during the pandemic and you've been able to walk in relatively fi relative financial security, think about how God wants you to give now. Now, this is not some uh, capital campaign. I, I'm not going to uh, put a thermometer on the stage and say, when we get to this point, we are now... Uh, spiritual enough. No, I'm just saying if in your time after this video you go through the questions, maybe you just sit with your family and just pray, hey God, what would it look like? You know, while we're doing projects around the house, we're maybe doing other things, we're going here, we're going here. Um, how can we make sure that of the first fruits of the things that we are given, time, money, resources, gifts, possessions, God, how can we give a first fruit back to you? How can we give a tithe? How can we give special gifts like the people of God did in the Old Testament? How can we honor you in that? And then verse 39, it says, we're not going to neglect the house of God, the temple. Now, while we've been away, there's been some things that have been done, but it'll be important for us when we come back to say, God, how can we look at the building? How can we say, God, this needs to be done. We need to take care of that. 
And so as we think about those things, we take, think about taking care of the house of God, the physical building, but we also need to think about taking care of ourselves spiritually because the Spirit of God, if we're a believer, lives inside of us and has given us eternal life with God forever. And so while we walk in this life as the Holy Spirit dwells, we need to take care of our physical bodies as well. And you may think, well, that's not hard for me to do. Of course I want to take care of myself. I don't want to um, allow myself to fall apart. In the same way, God says to us, while the Holy Spirit dwells inside and you take care of yourself and the family of faith, your family, let's take care of the work of the ministry, the things that we're going to do in the future. And I can guarantee you that as we walk through this difficult time, God has allowed us to be in, in, in a better place than many churches who have suffered, who have, who have maybe had members that have said, well, you know what? It's not really important to give to the work of the ministry. It's not really important to give of myself, my time, my money, my, my resources, my skills. And God is saying, remember the first fruits. Remember what the people of God did in the Old Testament and what still my, my holy expectation on you that I've lavished my grace upon you through Jesus. How much more should that make us want to give freely to what God is doing? I don't want to encourage you in that and remind you that living committed to God means giving sacrificially. And then let's take a look at this video and then we'll come back together. So my wife and I have been married for nine years. We have four kids. We had a lot of disagreements about finances and where our money should go. Our finances were really tight because of the fact that we were just not planning well. A lot of times it was just a completely stressful situation of knowing that we're living paycheck to paycheck and we are struggling to make ends meet. We would usually try and pay all of our bills down first and then whatever was left, it's like we might tie it. We never really felt like we had the money to do it. So then we took that Dave Ramsey's class and one of the things that he talks about is, you know, people say that a lot is I've paid all my bills and then at the bottom there's no money left to tithe. And I love his statement where he says, well, you have your budget upside down. You tithe first, then you start with your bills. That really opened our eyes that God wants you to give the first of your fruits and he tells you to test him on it. My wife and I were debating, uh, should we go ahead and just start giving the full amount of 10% of, of our income? And we were really nervous about it. I, we, we put it on a budget and we saw that it was gonna be negative. On paper, it, it wasn't going to work. We prayed about it, and we just took that leap of faith, and we decided to do it and just trust God. There were times where we were really close to not being able to pay a bill. No matter what the situation was, God always sent the money somehow. A few months later, I got a promotion at work, which came with a sizable salary increase. It was completely unexpected. We adjusted our tithe to match that salary increase. We knew that we were putting God first in our finances and every first bit of our finances was going to God and that ultimately took the money fight out of it. The church in their bulletin actually has their budget and what really made me feel good is I helped contribute to that. We kept faithfully giving. Um, it really helped our marriage as well. When we first started tithing, I also made the decision that I was gonna start volunteering at the church. It, it's good to know that, that I'm making a difference, not only with my tithing, but with my time. So as we got to take a look at someone else's life and how giving changed them, I wanna remind us it's not just about giving monetarily, but it's about giving of all of ourselves, serving God faith with our time, money, resources, gifts, possessions. Everything that we have belongs to God because living committed to God means giving sacrificially. And that's of everything. Let me leave you with this. Luke chapter 21, 1 through 4, it says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Let us be reminded of God's faithfulness to us and how he has blessed us during this difficult time and say, God, how can we 
live committed to you. Maybe you're a visitor with us today. Uh, maybe you've been watching these videos for a little while and you still have that question in your mind. Have I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? And I'd like to invite you to do that today. It's as easy as this. Admitting that you're a sinner. Everyone's sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Second thing is this. Believing that Jesus is God's Son. That He came, that He lived a sinless life, that He died on the cross for your sins so that you might have eternal life. The last thing is this. Confessing with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life. If you made that decision today, I'd like to invite you to reach out to us at the email listed below. Uh, if you have any questions, you'd just like to get connected to our church, again, email us at the email listed below, office at fbcelba.net. We'd be glad to connect with you. Let me pray for us and we'll close. Father, we thank you for the time you've given us to gather together um, to think about your word. God, that, that really um, living like we're a child of God, living like we belong to you means giving sacrificially. And that's in so many different areas, God. It has, yeah, we know it has to deal with our money. We know it has to do with our time. We know it has to do with our resources, our possessions. Everything that we have belongs to you. I pray that you'd help us to be faithful, to give back a, a small portion of that for the work of your ministry and what you have for us to do. Help us to be faithful in the way we live our lives. Um, to a world that's reaching out for hope. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Love you, church family. Have a great day.